Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Diego History Center. I'm Bill Lawrence, President and CEO, and you're seeing probably Shelby Gordon on your screen right now. We'll be coming to Shelby in just a moment. Um, if you'll bear with me, I am going to be sharing my screen. And um, really, it is a pleasure to have you all here for the virtual exhibition opening of Nathan Harrison, Born Enslaved, Died a San Diego Legend, and also its companion exhibition, Celebrate San Diego, um, Black History and Heritage. And here we go. All right. Thank you all for joining us. We want to take a moment to um, just acknowledge how uh, challenging the past year has been. Uh, with the pan a year ago, none of us expected that there would be a pandemic, and it's been a year of uh, tremendous challenge, uh, tremendous loss, and also tremendous innovation. None uh, part of that is also the uh, technology that we're seeing right now and working with to bring you this program. Some news to start with, though, we're very excited that uh, the San Diego History Center here in Balboa Park will be opening our museum for all of you to come back and visit these exhibits starting Friday, April 16th, and we will be open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We will also be opening our the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park on Saturday and Sunday starting on Saturday, April 17th, and again the hours will be 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're going to take just a moment before we go to uh, view the exhibits downstairs to tell you a little bit about the San Diego History Center. Some of you um, may not be familiar with who we are or what we do. We operate two museums um, on behalf of the citizens and visitors of San Diego, plus our research archive, which are uh, two museum, our, our muse main museum is located here in Balboa Park, and then also our historic home, the Sarah Museum in Presidio Park. So the San Diego History Center preserves, reveals, and promotes the history of the San Diego region. We connect the past to the present and create informed discussion about where as a community we're headed in for the future. We're a donation-based organization. Now what that means is we offer, uh, we have no set admission. So we welcome everyone regardless of ability to pay. Members and donors provide the majority of our funding and for you, members and donors who are joining us this evening, thank you very much. I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge and thank our trustees who are joining us as well. If you are not a member, I hope we can convince you to join and we'll have a little bit more information about that today. So our collections are highly prized and really represent some of the best of the history of our region. The History Center collections are over 45 million documents, two and a half million images that document how our region has changed over time, 1,700 oral histories, 1,500 pieces of fine art, and thousands of objects that are both the ordinary and extraordinary. Now, some of you have asked, when will we be able to go back into the research archive to um, be able to do research? Right now, the research archive will remain closed and it's through our online uh, research requests that we'll be able to facilitate your research. We have over 40,000 images that are online now uh, in our photo store that's available under the uh, photo section in our website. We are currently, and the reason for staying closed right now is we're focusing our efforts to make more of our collections available online. And we'll be in this situation for just a little bit. We invite you to please stay tuned in the coming months for some very exciting announcements that we have regarding this. Our collections are also community sourced. One of our most recent uh, community sourced uh, exhibits was Welcome to the Mix, Oral Histories, which is a fantastic opportunity. We've also in this pandemic time switched our educational program and our virtual progr our programming that we're doing tonight to virtual programs. We uh, make available to uh, schools throughout the San Diego region. And also we're picking up some from around the country, virtual education programs. For example, stories from our arch archives, uh, live lessons with museum educators, uh, spaces and places in San Diego history and Girl Scouts from home. 
Also virtual discussions. Uh, San Diego 101 is our, our entry level learn about the history of the San Diego region. And we've done a few of, of those already. And we have several more coming up. You can learn more about our virtual discussions and our programming online at our site. One of the uh, real, I think, high points, um, if there were after we closed a year ago, was that we quickly shifted from an institution that focused strictly on our um, museum <laughs> space to really our online portal. And it began with history happening now, share your story. And you can go online and submit your story and be part of San Diego history. A hundred years from now, uh, historians uh, will be looking back at how we coped with this pandemic. And this is just a phenomenal uh, resource for the community. Today, we are here to uh, open Nathan Harrison, born and slave, died a San Diego legend, and celebrate San Diego. And these two exhibits would not happen without the financial support of the following. First, our sincere gratitude and thanks go to Una Davis and Jack McGrory for their early um, investment to make this happen. Also, the Gerald T. and Inez Grant Parker Foundation for their support and for their mark matching grant. They gave us um, uh, um, a challenge to raise funds specifically for this. Also, we would like to thank uh, Trustee Brian and Rose Mooney, Rick Engineering, George Cowan, and Julie Cowan Novak. Also, Julie is one of our trustees fund at the San Diego Foundation, as well as the Union Bank Foundation for their support of this exhibit. Celebrate San Diego. Two opportunities for you to become involved in this exhibition are through Nominate a Community Hero and What Is Our San Diego Black History Timeline Missing? We're very, very honored to have our first presentation of these two components by Union Bank of San Diego. And we are grateful for Union Bank for their participation today. All right. Um, enough about the background of the History Center. Let's go now down to the exhibit space and Shelby Gordon, the marketing manager for the San Diego History Center. Shelby, it's all yours. Thank you, Bill. We're exceptionally grateful to be able to share these two wonderful exhibitions with you today. We're going to start with a superstar of history in San Diego, Nathan Harrison, a legend, one of the first Black homesteaders in San Diego who had a very popular uh, personality and was a great celebrity and had many, many tourists actually drive and go to Palomar Mountain to see him and visit with him. And you think today, oh, just a trip to Palomar Mountain. Yes, that's what we think today. But during Nathan Harrison's time, that trip actually took three entire days. <laughs> The majestic views of Palomar Mountain have been sacred to the people who have enjoyed them for over 10,000 years. The Luiseno Indians called the mountain Mother Mountain. It is no surprise that Nathan Harrison, too, felt a deep connection to the land. The land that for thousands of years has been connecting humanity to their earthly roots. The journey to his homestead on Palomar Mountain was precipitous, riveting and full of surprises, much like Harrison's life. The trek was a three-day odyssey that included a train to Oceanside, a drive to tin can flats at the base of the mountain, then a full day horse or auto-drawn stage to the top of Palomar Mountain. The journey, although precarious, can be seen as a love story to the environment that he called home. A love story told through unforgiving terrain. A love story that with each turn of the wheel, with each clop of a hoof, dove deeper into the extraordinary nature of the land. It was a feat to reach the homestead, but with that effort came the love of the land. The journey was not easy, just as Nathan's journey to freedom was not easy. But sometimes to experience something truly special something transcendent, 
something extraordinary. It is worth all the painstaking, exhausting effort to arrive. Welcome to Nathan Harrison, born enslaved, died a San Diego legend, the exhibit. I'm Seth Malios, a professor of anthropology at San Diego State University, and I'm the guest curator of this exhibit. It truly is a thrill to welcome you all today. I've directed this project for 20 years. In fact, it was 20 years ago that I first presented on Nathan Harrison at my job interview at SDSU. I've been an archeologist for 30 years and I started at a little place called Flowerdew 100, a place that most people haven't heard of. The important thing about Flowerdew 100 though, is that in 1619, the first enslaved Africans brought to the new world went to Flower Dew 100. So I've been studying African-American archeology span for over 30 years. And what I'd like to do with this exhibit and with our discussion today is tie together those stories of those first earliest Africans on American soil, all the way through Harrison's story to the 21st and 20th century today. Now, I'd like to begin by telling you a little about Harrison himself. This is an individual that was born in Kentucky in the 1830s, born into slavery, and brought west for the gold rush. We don't know that much about his time while he was enslaved, but once he's in California, we start to learn more of the story. His owner passes away, he migrates down through Los Angeles, and finally into San Diego County during the 1816s and 1870s. And it's during that time that he starts working for different individuals as a rancher, as a shepherd, and then he patents land at the bottom of Palomar Mountain. He later sells that, but then he homesteads a second track up on Palomar Mountain. That's where our site is. That's where the archaeology took place. So that's the overall context for this individual that overcame amazing obstacles during his lifetime and succeeded in becoming a local legend. Now, a key part of this exhibit is putting Harrison in historical and cultural context. Now, I have to warn you, we're gonna turn a lot of traditional California history on its head with this exhibit. The first is looking at California as a free state. Now that's something that we all learned in grade school, but for many individuals, including Nathan Harrison, California was no free state because he was brought to California enslaved before California became a state, he stayed enslaved. He and thousands of other African Americans stayed enslaved all the way through the 1850s. The next segment we'll look at is the 1860s, the Civil War. We're taught in school that California was largely irrelevant during the Civil War, that it was something focused east of the Mississippi. But what we see is not only was California important, but Southern California was a hotbed for secessionism and for the Confederates. And that was the world that Nathan Harrison entered. If you've ever wondered why there are so many memorials to Confederates in San Diego, this is the answer. When people were migrating westward, Northerners went to Northern California, Southerners went to Southern California. Now, even when we go into the next decade, the 1870s, the famed Gilded Age, we then need to look at Harrison in context as well, because even though the Gilded Age is celebrated for many Americans doing well, it was still a very dangerous time for Harrison. When we think of the Jim Crow South, we mainly isolate it to that area of the American South, but it was prevalent in San Diego as well. There were sundown towns, towns where it was unsafe for African Americans and other ethnic minorities to spend the night in San Diego County. In fact, Escondido, the largest town next to Palomar Mountain, was one of those sundown towns. And so we see this migration of Harrison moving away from constant duress, and that's what leads him up to Palomar Mountain. And by the time we get into the 1880s, 1890s, and early 1900s, this early modern age, Harrison is living in this cabin up on the mountain, and he becomes this tourism destination. He was the person to see during this time. Individuals, they would take a, a wagon drawn by horses up to the mountain or take some of the earliest automobiles to see if their car could make it up the mountain, and there would be Nathan Harrison. Now remember, 
He had claimed the water. He had homestead the land. This was his property. People were coming to visit him, and he welcomed them. He brought them over to his house. He gave them water, and they engaged in this, this building of community. Now, one thing you'll note through this tourism guideline is we see a lot of souvenirs, and the number one souvenir was the photograph. And that is a key part of Harrison's story. Because when we talk about photography, we need to emphasize that Harrison was likely the most photographed San Diegan of the 19th century. Look at all these images, over 30 different images, and I bet there are even more out there of Harrison at his home on Palomar Mountain. You can see he's the focal point of these photographs, but I want to emphasize that he was an active agent in the performance of these photos. And what I mean by that, he could see people coming from miles away. If he didn't want to engage with them, he could just head in the other direction. But when Harrison heard people coming, he would immediately run and put on his raggediest clothing. This was part of his performance. His aw shucks routine made people feel comfortable, posed for their photos, engaged with him. And that was part of why he was so celebrated, this role that he played. Now, we're very fortunate at the History Center because we have my favorite part here, and that is the reconstruction of the cabin. R remember, I'm an archaeologist, so I've only seen this cabin before as the bottom few rocks in the ground. That's what we uncovered. But here you have a facsimile of his exact cabin. The dimensions are extremely important. What we find in the ground is a perfect 11-foot square. You may be saying, who cares about 11 foot squares? Well, this is where it gets so fascinating because African Americans during this time period, they build their houses in square plans, whereas Anglo Americans, they build in rectangles. And so we see something that is distinctively African American, and it's something that Harrison brought with him in his mind as he came cross country. In, in fact, this looks just like a slave quarters from the South on sites that I've dug in Virginia and the Carolinas, except it's it's 3,000 miles away and about 150 years later. This cabin reflects a lot about Harrison, especially the doorway that's weighing in here at five foot three inches. He was not a tall man. So, so duck carefully as we enter the cabin. This is where it gets really special because you get to see the best of the 50,000 artifacts that we found at the site. Some of these artifacts are mundane everyday objects but some of them tell very special stories about Harrison. As we look through this exhibit, you can see a bottle of a Gordon's dry gin and all the way from London, England. You see fired rifle cartridges and bullets. And then you see some fancier stuff as well. You see a polished watch back and you also see a silver quarter from 1899. Now, many of those talk about his interaction spheres, but these two in the corner here really talk about relationships. A greenstone pendant showing his close ties with the indigenous community. Remember, he had married two different Native women at different times. And then this iron cross, he was baptized Catholic by the chief of the Rincon tribe down at the bottom of the hill. Now, there are other surprises in this exhibit. And what is so fantastic is it was all these artifacts pulled together all 50,000 that showed us a pattern that told us the secret to the mystery of Nathan Harrison's identity. And if you want to know what that secret is, well, then you're going to have to come down here to the San Diego History Center and find out for yourself. When we went out there, no stones are poking out of the ground, waist high weeds. There was nothing that said to you, this is where somebody would build a house. You hear about all this historic stuff and then actually being at a historic site. It felt surreal. You start gently scraping, like going down slowly but surely, you'll, you'll start seeing that you're going deeper and deeper. It's a slow process, but that, that slowness, it's suspenseful. That, that's my favorite part of being an archaeologist, was getting my hands in the dirt, um, digging up the artifacts, uh finding like finding stuff like it was amazing the harrison site is one of the great ones because you always find stuff and then you just bag that right like paperwork and once that's uh, done we bring it to the lab and then that's when the process starts archaeology is looking at the material artifacts that people leave behind to learn about how they lived 
We come to the lab to catalog all the artifacts. Cleaning the artifacts, labeling the artifacts, cataloging the artifacts, gluing the things back together. It's almost a 10 to one ratio of one day of digging takes about 10 days of processing and researching. That's where we actually analyze and research the artifacts and see how it pertains to the site, how it relates to the person who lived there, the people, the time period, where it was produced, all that kind of stuff. For the Harrison Project, we've found things that give idea into his daily life. So how did he eat? We find a lot of food cans, sardine and corned beef. Uh, how did he make relationships? He would trade water for different things from visitors. So it kind of gives insight into his daily life. Just how one small item can lead to such a big story is really cool. Mm -hmm over 220 buttons. For a site with one person, that is astronomical to have that many buttons. And it kind of hinted at something more and made us want to study it. Why, why would there be so many? The cool thing about historical archaeology is we get to combine it with documents. So we know that people went up to his cabin uh, area to stop for water. And we see pictures of them giving him things. They're giving him a pair of pants every time. He's gonna have a lot of pair, a lot of pairs of jeans. So this is a flobu plate, and it was um, made in England. This was England's way of replicating porcelain, but cheaper. It wasn't made till 1910, so it was something that he obtained later on in life. One of the crazy things about archaeology is. What do you do when you find something that is the exact opposite of all the historical records? When we started finding the fired rifle cartridges, I thought, oh, who knows, maybe they were Harrison's, maybe they weren't. But then when we found hundreds that were all the same caliber, the same rim fire, the same weapon, you started to realize, oh, no, 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 this was Harrison stuff. What is this saying that this isn't individual was armed? and was armed at a time where there were so many laws working against that. And so this is where you, you come to appreciate, okay, this artifact is everywhere, but it's in none of the records, it's in none of the photos. Could this be something that he was keeping secret? And then the case just starts building. And then you start looking at the literature during this time period and you see that for ethnic minorities, that was a survival strategy. You, you came up with this double life and it's all playing out right in front of us in this little stone cabin with 50,000 artifacts. I think the number one thing is that this is public history. We're doing everything we can to get this story out there and to gauge everyone with this history. It does no one any benefit if archaeologists just dig stuff up and then it hides here in my lab. We want this to be as engaging as possible. We want everyone to see this story, see these artifacts, and we hope that it has legs beyond the excavation. If you can have something that's accessible beyond that, I think that's when it's really special. Hello, my name is Jamie Bastidi. I'm a graduate student at SDSU. And welcome to the archaeological part of the exhibit. So we have recreated a portion of our excavation site here in the museum for you to experience, including replicas of our five foot by five foot units. So those units are important because we did uh, artifact analysis in them and it showed that Harrison had three activity areas um, at his site. So the first is the cabin that Dr. Malio spoke about earlier. The second is the patio, which is this section here in front of the cabin. Um, this is where he primarily did his cooking and his eating, and we found various fragments of ceramics, glass, and bone. The final part, um, the third part of the uh, area is the trash refuge area, refuse area, which is along the edges of the patio. So this is essentially where Harrison just threw his trash away. Um, he did not have a designated area to put his trash, he just threw it out past the patio. So in order to bring the archaeology to life for you here in the museum. We're into in implementing some really cool technology. Uh, the first is augmented reality, which is an interactive experience that involves downloading an app onto your smartphone or tablet. And um, in this case, it'll be based on the units that we have here. So each unit has a, draw, a line drawing in it. 
and using a, your smartphone or tablet, which I have here, I'm gonna show you how it do, is done. It will show you artifacts that have been physically dug out of this unit on Palomar Mountain. So this, this unit had spring stud buttons. And this one over here had a Pinex bottle, which was used for medicine. So each unit here in the museum will have a portion of these um, artifacts in them. Um, another aspect of the AR, which is interesting, is we have some historical narratives that you'll be able to listen to that relate parts of Harrison's life. Those are scattered around the museum and are represented with an ear icon. Um, the last part of the technology that we have is this projection area here. Um, this is actually our archaeologist demonstrating the techniques and tools that we use in the field. So as you can see on the end here, the archaeologist is using a trowel to pull up some dirt. He's going to put that on a dustpan, put it in the bucket that's next to him, and then he'll take it to a screen to sift and see if he found any artifacts. And the one over here, he's, he's actually, it looks like he actually found something here. So you'll be able to notice this when you're here and see what it's like to actually physically be in the field and digging. If you would like more information about the techniques and tools that archeologists use, we do have a tools of the trade display here with photos and in more in deep in depth descriptions of the tools and why we use them and when we use them. So, I want to thank you. I am excited for you to come and see this. And I'm going to pass over the microphone over to Tina, who's going to talk about the um, exhibit. Thank you, Jamie. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Tina Zarpour. I'm the Vice President of uh, Collections and Education and Community Engagement here at the History Center. Oops. Uh, what I'm going to be showing you today is just a, a sneak peek at our Celebrate Black History and Heritage exhibit. So the goal of Celebrate is really to showcase what the San Diego History Center has in the way of its permanent holdings that tells us about um, black history in San Diego. And then also to invite, um, open our vaults and invite people to contribute to um, developing that history and developing that collection. The very first element I want to demonstrate is our timeline here. We call it the triple timeline. And you'll notice that there are three bands. The top band is called, um, showcases national history and US events. This middle band is all about San Diego history and what's going on in our region. And all of these photographs here are from our permanent collection. And finally, this bottom band is all about Nathan Harrison. So it starts with where, when we think he was born, and then goes beyond that. Um, the purpose of this triple timeline is to really put the history in context with each other, to put it in conversation with each other, so that we're not just looking at Nathan Harrison's life, we're looking at what else is happening in San Diego, and we're looking at what else is happening nationally as well. Um, this timeline is double-sided. Um, it's 12 feet, so um, on one side and 12 feet on the other side. And what's really cool about it is that we are acknowledging that this is not complete. The history is not complete. It's not, we don't have the comprehensive story here. So what we have done is invited people to submit and, um, and people have done just that. So you'll see these little blue things here. What's our timeline missing? This refers to the screen over here. And people have submitted some of those items that our timeline is missing. For example, this one talks about Richard Freeman, one of two uh, black men in early Old Town San Diego, and he was a, a saloon owner. Um, and the story of the US Bennington, USS Bennington explosion and the heroism of one of the shipmates, uh, John Turpin. So we're going to go around to this other side over here. Oops. You can see our timeline continuing on to the other side. And coming over here. Um, and then you can see that Nathan, Nathan Harrison's story, although he passes away in 1920, the history doesn't end there. His story doesn't end there. So one of the things that we've tried to show is the way that his story has been changed through time as well and, and been used in different ways. 
And finally, we end in San Diego um, in 2016 and 2020 and nationally to talk about um, protest and politics and, and the significant events that were happening in our nation. And then a second element of our Celebrate exhibit is called Heroes. So this is uh, where the community again can nominate a hero. We've started this uh, process way back in December. We've received a number of fantastic submissions from community people. Uh, we have room to display 12 here, 12 at a time, and they will be switching out periodically throughout the life of the exhibit. Uh, one of my favorite ones, you can take a look around. One of my favorite ones right now is uh, Miss Silura Barron. Miss Barron was the first black woman delegate in a national political convention. Lots of milestones in her life and also a really cool picture as well. And then we'll, we're gonna walk over here to this case. And finally, this are, are some of the items. This shows some of the items from our holdings and our collections. Uh, this is a really cool item right here. This is a number donated by Ms. Jackie Thompson. We just received this over the summer. Uh, Jackie Thompson was the first black female Olympian from San Diego to compete. Uh, and she competed in the 1972 Munich Olympics and graciously donated uh, the number that she wore when she was in competition. And finally, we have some art pieces that were a recent acquisitions. This is from Duke Windsor. And he represents actually the first uh, African-American who uh, 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 that we've collected uh, as part of our art collection, as part of our fine art collection as well. So thank you. It's a pleasure being here. And I wanna turn it over now to Shelby. Thank you, Dr. Tina. As we've been mentioning um, all throughout our presentation today, this is a community sourced exhibitions, particularly on the Celebrate San Diego side. And as Dr. Tina mentioned, there are two ways that the community can participate. One is to add reflections, memories, milestones, and photography to augment our timeline of San Diego Black history. We uh, have been working with a group of volunteers who have been uh, providing counsel and advising us throughout the development. And they were the ones that really pointed out there are some issues and some things and some key points missing. We thought what a great way to involve the community. So you can do that on our website. And also, as Dr. Tina mentioned, we are collecting submissions to nominate a local hero. And these um, came in this week and we are so excited about them and the submissions continue to come in. I even submitted one of my local heroes yesterday. It's super simple on our website. We encourage you to do that. You will see your heroes as well as your submissions for the timeline both in our physical space and in our virtual space. And I'm gonna to toss it back to Bill, and he's gonna just give you a little primer of how this beautiful exhibition, um, how you can participate and how you can become part of our celebration of San Diego history and heritage. Bill? Thank you, Shelby. Um, it's just absolutely wonderful to see how this is all unfolding and I really, cannot be more blown away, if I can use that term, uh, about just how wonderful everything is. And we're so honored to have everybody participate. Um, we understand, obviously, we want you to come to the History Center here in Balboa Park when we're able to be open and when we're open to actually visit the experience, uh, uh, visit the ex exhibit. But you're also able to visit it online. And for the first time, we've actually built an online exhibition for both Nathan Harrison and Celebrate San Diego that you can do. And it, um, you'll be able to, you can access that through our website, sandiegohistory.org. And this is, for example, the Nate Harrison. So Seth was talking about the gold rush, the Civil War, the Gilded Age, um, the idea of uh, what a sundown town is. All of that is, is looked at here. Also, uh, for example, you'll be able to take that journey up the mountain to visit uh, where Nate Harrison is. 
you'll be able to see the cabin and go inside the cabin, look at some of the artifacts. And one of the things that's really um, quite fun is experiencing the, um, the dig. And so just as it was mentioned that with um, the uh, augmented reality on the physical space, you can also see what's uh, dug up in, in these areas. We want you to come to the History Center when you feel safe and when we are able to open. Um, but also we believe that it's critically important that we continue to uh, promote uh, the history uh, online as well. And we would not be able to do this, of course, without support. And um, Sheila, thank you for uh, putting up the how you can help or how you can contribute. You can text Celebrate SD to 44 321 or our website, sandiegohistory.org slash donation. Also, we are old fashioned enough that we enjoy have hearing from you and having a phone call. So don't hesitate. Um, also reach out to us um, via email, um, info at sandiegohistory.org or membership at sandiegohistory.org as well. Let's um, get set up for question and answer now. I think we've got Seth and Tina and Jamie uh, and uh, Shelby ready. So Shelby, you ready with that first question or do you want uh, either Sheila and I to field it for you? No, I think we're ready to go. Okay. Um, the away. first question, Seth, really is for you and Jamie about the status of the dig right now in light of the pandemic. Are you digging now? If not, when do you plan to dig? Thanks, Shelby. One of the most exciting uh, exciting things is that we are going to dig this summer. Uh, last season's dig was canceled, um, but we do have the green light to dig this summer. And there, there are two amazing things about that. One is, you know, we, we get to get out of our home offices and actually get outside and do the archaeology. The second is, is we're going to have a live feed from the dig to the History Center Theater here. And this is where you all can join in the digging process. Now, I, I'm not gonna promise that it's a, a thrill a minute. It's a, a little bit like watching people fish, but we do find a lot of great things. And, and you get to be part of that process of discovery. We don't know what we're gonna find. Uh, two years ago when we were digging on the last day of excavation, we found uh, a uh, rifle powder canister that, that I hadn't seen in San Diego before. So there's still untold treasures in the ground up there. But June 1st through the 19th, we're going to be living up on the mountain, digging up there, and we'll be doing that live feed so everyone can come down to the History Center and watch us dig. And we are so excited about that. Seth, I don't so mean to put you on the spot. The You're gonna oh, wait a minute. Hold the mic. Bill's gonna it, ask a question. Can I interject for a second? Seth, yeah. not to put you on the spot, but um, we're hoping that um, uh, you and Vicki will allow us to bring a group from the History Center up as well. Yeah, you're not putting me on the spot at all. Uh, so one of the things about this project is it is public archaeology and we want to get people engaged with the site. Now, the, the tricky thing is, as you all saw from the different videos, is that that road is tricky to get up. And so what we want to figure out is how to get people up the road. But we are excited to get folks up there. I, I've dug it at Jamestown where we had a million visitors to the site each year. I've dug at the Whaley House where it seemed like we had a million visitors every summer um, and that's part of the process we want to engage with the people because this is everyone's history uh, and it's something we're, we're very excited about we'll work out the logistics on it but we will have multiple options for people to come out to the mountain and and June 19th is going to be our public open house uh, that we do every year when we're digging I, I can't tell you how excited we are to get back to the dirt I know that sounds strange but for archaeologists we've been like fish out of water being locked up in, in our offices so we're very excited to do this. Okay. Um, uh, we have a question from um, uh, regarding Escondido was a sundown town. Can you say more about how we know that? Seth? 
Yeah, this is, this is, oh, sorry to, to interrupt. Um, this is something that is in the old oral histories when people who knew Nathan Harrison were interviewed in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, they talked about the racial climate and they all emphasized that this was very difficult for African Americans, especially because they called it Scundido. They, they had dropped the E and they talked about how Scundido was a sundown town and, and, people had to flee before the sun set. I'd like to bring up a, a parallel example too. There was an individual by the name of John Ballard. Same story as Nathan Harrison in terms of being born in the 1830s, enslaved in Kentucky, uh, was brought to California as part of the gold rush, uh, got his freedom, migrated southward. But John Ballard homesteaded land on top of a mountain in Malibu. Uh, up near Los Angeles. So same very similar story to Harrison, except John Ballard didn't put on an act for everybody. He, he didn't act deferential. He didn't engage with people in the same way. And the locals burned him off the land. And so this, this gives you that greater portrait of there, there were sundown towns where it was part of the policy of people to police it, to make sure no one was spending the night there. But then there were additionally hundreds and hundreds of acts of aggression against people of color to get them off their land. Um, so to answer your question very specifically, this is in over a, a dozen of the different oral histories. And then recently scholars have written books on sundown towns and many of them pinpoint as Dito is one of them. Okay, Seth, I'm going to stay with you for a second, if that's all right. Um, sure. Do we know anything about his wife and children? Yeah, it's, it's one of the most intriguing questions, and there, there are two different angles to this story. One is that Harrison had married an indigenous woman who had children from a previous union, and he cared very much for these children. In fact, inside the cabin there's a photograph and that photograph was found in the cabin uh, many many years ago and on the back of it it says from your granddaughter dory mary and we were able to track down who that was so um, her father was fred sheep smith one of the famous shepherds of the area and uh, her grandmother was was harrison's wife um, and and so we see that line so there's a, a step grandchild who who had many children um, she was buried in los angeles we haven't been able to track down the step great grandchildren for that matter. So that's one story, but there's another story as well, and I'll try and keep this fairly short. Um, in 1913, Harrison lost control of the property. So he had been working for somebody, and that individual was paying his property taxes. And then that individual passed away. And so nobody was paying Harrison's property taxes. Uh, People didn't have very much cash at all during this time, and it was often a trade for services. So this individual passes away, no one's paying the property taxes, and so the county auctions off the Harrison property. And an individual named Nathan Hargrave picked up the property cheap, and he then went up to Palomar Mountain and said, this is my property, get off my land. And the locals uh, on the mountain community were outraged and they all rallied around Nathan Harrison and said, absolutely not Nathan Hargrave, you do not get this property. And they were able to get the property back and they arranged for Harrison to sell one of his horses to Nathan Hargrave. The point of this story, uh, you knew I'd get to it. The point of it is Harrison was distraught because he told his friends he wanted his daughter who was a nurse in New York to have the property. And this is where it gets so intriguing because this could be a reference to his time in Kentucky. That nurse in New York may have been an offshoot of that life. Um, we have tried to reach out for folks. I, I'm hoping that this exhibit, this story gets so popular that, that people suddenly will be able to find these old connections and help us out. So the simple answer is no, we, we haven't been able to find any living descendants. Uh, we know of some of the step descendants, but that is still a major part of research for this project. Thank you, Seth, that was uh, great. Can you talk a little bit more about the significance of the uh, 11 feet um, and the squareness of the cabin? Yeah, so one of the neat things uh, about the cabin is that the dimensions are so exact. Uh, not only is it 11 feet on the sides, but the diagonals are perfect matches of 15 and a half feet. This is no rhombus, this is, this is an exact square. And what is so neat about this is you get to see that both it's rustic 
and it's exact at the same time. And what we've seen across different areas of the country is these square floor plans. And it doesn't matter whether people are building timber houses where they're post holes, the post holes are an exact square, or if they're building out of stone or out of brick, we always see that square floor plan. And what that actually gets at is proxemics. Proxemics is something we're really familiar with now because we know when someone's closer than six feet from us because of the pandemic. And, and what we see is part of the West African tradition is people are used to being closer to each other than the Anglo-American tradition. Anglo-Americans are used to having more distance. And part of that is just the sizes of the houses they build. This is not tied to status. This is not a wealth thing. It's just in terms of comfort levels with shape. And so it's the exact size of each of the sides of the cabin that determine this. And what you end up seeing is, so imagine you're in a part of a country where you have an Anglo-American and African-American, same wealth, uh, same status, same occupation, same materials, and they will build houses that look identical, except the African American house will be square on a floor plan and the Anglo American one will be a rectangle. And that's where it gets so neat to be able to look at these patterns in the grounds and to be teasing out a little bit about ethnic identity. So let's go rejoin over, the. Since you're over in, at the cabin, stay there for a second. Um, uh, we're staying here. Uh, there's, there's been some questions regarding the cartridges that were recovered. How do you know that they were actually from Nathan Harrison's period, as opposed to being so, later? Yes, I get so excited to talk about this. I often interrupt the questions. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not going to bump my head on this. So uh, there, there are a couple of really important things about this. Uh, the first is, is that many of these cartridges, and it's going to be tough to zoom in here, they have a stamp on the back of them. And the stamp tells you what time period it was produced and the company that produced it. So we have a very narrow date range. These are some of the most datable artifacts out there, which is very, very helpful. The second thing is, is these cartridges are often specific to certain kinds of rifles, certain kinds of firearms. And, and that's where we start seeing the possibilities narrow in terms of who was owning it. What's interesting is we've been going through all these photographs and it turns out in one of the old photographs there is a rifle lying next to Harrison. It's not the center of the photograph, but it's lying next to him. And we see that it's, a, it's an 1879 Winchester. Um, and, and that ties very, that's, that's the gun that, that won the Wild West. And that ties very nicely uh, to these cartridges. Now, we do see a few that don't match up perfectly, and those were likely from people visiting. But because these cartridges were in every layer of the site and associated with things that were distinctively Harrison's from the photos. We find them next to his pipes, next to his suspenders, uh, next to, th to, to things that, to his boot, to his leather boot that we see. We see this direct case. And then one of the great things is we were able to pull a thumbprint off of one of them. This is something, so I, so I wrote a book on, on Harrison uh, where I poured my heart and soul into everything we found into this. And it includes the detailed analysis of how we were able to get the thumbprint off of the cartridge. Um, and that's where we have that, that personal connection. So all of these are inferences. I, I don't want to suggest for a second that there's definitive proof. But when you find 200 fired rifle cartridges that are of the exact make and model that match the rifle that was sitting next to Harrison, and it's associated with 50,000 of his artifacts, then you start getting a very confident look at that. And furthermore, remember that every single one of those artifacts fits into that 1865 to 1916 date range that was when Harrison was on the mountain. So we're pretty confident about that. We're going to Go back to the gang here, and let's field a question. Tell Bill that we are going to change the camera battery. Uh, okay. Hey, I, Bill, we're going to change. You got that? I think I heard Mike say we're changing the camera battery for a second. So um, we are changing okay. the camera battery, and so it's back to Bill. Okay. Well, um, and actually, I think that we've answered just about all of our questions. Um, hopefully, you're not seeing. Uh, the thing go up and down, but that's okay. Um, uh, Seth mentioned uh, his book, and I should show that up for you. We do have that available through the San Diego History Center, Born a Slave, Died a Pioneer, Nathan Harrison by Seth Malios. It's um, an, an incredibly great uh, book and a good, a very good read. Um, so I would 
recommend that to you all as well. Um, I think what I would like to do is take a moment to uh, start thanking everybody as well, particularly, um, you know, we're, we're, we wanted to keep this to about an hour and it looks like the battery has been changed. So we can probably take um, one more question or so. Um, Seth, are you, are you with me now? Let's see. Seth, um, yes, we're, we're going to take we're one final question and then we'll, we'll start wrapping things up. Is the Nate Harrison Homestead on Palomar Mountain uh, recognized as either a local or a national monument? Uh, if not, are there any plans for that? Okay, so it's interesting because there is a memorial to Harrison that was placed in the early 1920s, and that is on the state register, um, and and it was it was done back in the, in the 1980s, and that's very important. So we do have plans for it in the future. We need to finish up our excavations first, uh, and then we'll go through the the site recording process on that. And and it's something that that we want everyone to be engaged in this for the future. Remember that the site is currently on private property, but it's a bed and breakfast and it's a lovely place to visit it's a lovely place to stay and you get to see the archaeological excavations if you happen to be there during june um, so this is part of this ongoing process of, of public engagement with the mountain uh, we also want to work with state parks on, on top of the mountain to work new partnerships with them um, i'd also like to emphasize uh, there there are other things that the history center has pulled together really nicely that coordinate with the exhibit uh, there was a recent journal that has four articles that my students and I wrote on that, that tie into Nathan Harrison and they're very engaging. Um, at the same time, there's a new feature in Archaeology Magazine on our project. And so a lot of things are, are coming together really nicely. And, and that's where the summer gets a, is so exciting because you, you get to be here in Balboa Park, in the History Center, see the exhibit, and you get to watch what we're doing at the dig as well. Uh, so we really feel like even though we're still dealing with pandemic issue, issues, we're, we're right on the cusp of a, a real springboard to fund the summer. Beth, thank you very much. I, I, um, we'll start wrapping it up uh, right now. We're almost at an hour and we appreciate you all being part of this. Um, it's wonderful to see Vicki Morgan uh, be part of the uh, uh, audience here today, as well as uh, Yvette Porter Moore and uh, Wendy McKinney as well. Wendy, it's great to see you here. Um, I'd like to thank our exhibition uh, donors, um, Una Davis and Jack McGrory uh, in particular, as well as the other donors to this. All, all donors uh, are listed on our website at both Celebrate San Diego and um, Nate Harrison. Our special thanks as well to um, uh, Union Bank for their support of Nominate a, a Local Hero and the Black uh, San Diego History Timeline please go to our website and nominate a hero and tell us what is missing from our timeline. Um, Seth, thank you to you, to Jamie, and your entire SDSU team for, throughout this uh, process. I'd like to mention and thank Mark Maraca for his principal design of the Nathan Harrison exhibit, uh, Cinnabar, who is our construction partner in this as well. Uh, today would not be possible and our multimedia would not be possible without Mike Watson and um, Video Approach. Thank you, Mike, for that. Brian Alvara for our augmented reality. And uh, a special thank and shout out to Bobby Buchanan as well of Buchanan Design for their great work on the online exhibitions. I'd also really like to thank and call out the staff of the San Diego History Center. Uh, this last year has been one that has been incredibly challenging. And they have risen to every occasion. They have risen to every opportunity. And uh, you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with uh, Dr. Tina Zapor, Shelby Gordon. Um, running technical support on the video is uh, Samantha Alberts. And she's got a new technical title now that um, is not in her job description. But that's the way we do things at the San Diego History Center. We wear multiple hats and we do a little bit of everything. Um, we strongly believe in the value that history brings to our community. We thank you, who, uh, thank you to our members and thank you to you all for attending this evening. 
And uh, that will conclude our, our program for tonight. It will be available on our YouTube channel in the next day or so. So thank you very much and good night from the San Diego History Center in Balboa Park.